thank you very, very much for joining us this evening um, for the event about supporting poverty learning in early year settings and also an introduction to the Health and Care Staff in Scotland Act. Um, we hope to share information about the ways uh, you can be involved in the role you play in empowering and supporting parents with the best advice so that they can effectively potty train their children. And we'd also like to take this opportunity to discuss with you the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act, which some of you might know about. Um, it's due to be implemented in Scotland on April the 1st of next year, 2024. Um, and so we'll be joined by Joanne Duncan and Candice Aitken uh, from the Safe Staffing team at the Inspectorate who will explore this with you. But first, though, I'd like to introduce you to Juliet Rayner. Juliet's the Chief Executive of Eric, and some of you might know that this is the Children's Bowel and Bladder Charity. And Juliet joined Eric as their CEO in May 2015. With her team, she has established a clear vision and direction, raising awareness of the impact that bladder and bowel conditions can have on children and young people and, the, and also on their families. So during Juliet's time at Eric, she's become internationally recognised as a responsible and um, uh, Eric's been recognised as a responsible and ambitious organisation maintaining the needs of children, um, young people and families and keeping them at the heart of decision making. Juliet's the paediatric work stream lead um, on NHS led National Bladder and Bowel Programmes. She's the co-chair for the UK Paediatric Continence Forum and the children's lead on the Bladder and Bowel Confidence Health Integration Team, which is led by the Bristol Health Partners. So before coming into the voluntary and community sectors, Juliet spent many years in public service working at national regional regional and community level. Much of our policy and performance experience has been across multi-agency programmes and multidisciplinary teams, including strategic partnerships and drug and alcohol action teams and neighbourhood renewal partnerships. Juliet, thank you so much for coming uh, along today. Before um, we move into your discussion, could I just um, mention to people about the kind of housekeeping rules today? Jen, would you? Thank you very much. So you'll realise that there are no mics uh, tonight and that's because we're anticipating quite a big audience and it might be difficult for us to, to manage that. But there is a chat line and you can put your questions or your comments in the chat as we go along. Um, and in addition to that, uh, there'll be a QA session at the end of uh, both Juliet's discussion and uh, Joanne and Candice's discussion. Um, we're really interested in gathering your opinions um, during the, the discussions tonight. And, and so Je Jenny, who's organising things behind the scene for us, is going to run some polls for us uh, so that we can collect that information. Also in the background is Jackie Dennis, who's going to be checking on the chat line, answering your queries as we go along and raising issues if there's anything specific that people want to know about. So um, please keep us, uh, you know, although you don't have a kind of a verbal presence tonight, please keep, keep uh, putting your questions in the chat line and we'll get to you as soon as we can. Next slide, please, Jenny. So the aims of the session um, are about discovering the role that ELC providers can play in empowering and supporting parents with the best advice so that they can effectively potty train their children and avoid problems. To introduce you to the Health and Care Staff in Scotland Act and what it might mean for ELC services and provide you with the opportunities to participate um, and explore both topic areas to increase your understanding of those. Next slide, please, Jenny. And also maybe to, if you're not familiar with them, discuss some of the good practice documents that are around at the moment and the, uh, that are topical at the moment um, and maybe gather your views on, on those also. So um, I'm not going to say any more, um, although I'm going to be kind of comparing the event tonight. And I should have said at the very beginning, I don't think I did, that I'm Marie McCary and I'm Chief Nurse here at the Care Inspectorate. 
and I have oversight of um, quite a lot of different programmes at the the um, at the care inspectorate. But in a past life, I was a midwife and health visitor, and that's where my interest in ELC practice comes from. So let me pass you on to Juliet. Thank you. Right. Is this the is this the presentation as it will be displayed for everybody? Right. Well, a good evening, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here, and thank you for inviting me to come along. I must admit, when um, M Marie was given the introduction, I've I've never quite heard my biography read back to me. It sounds rather grand. So, um, yeah, I hope I don't disappoint you. I'm just an ordinary down to earth kind of person and uh, <laughs> we'll take it from there. I'm also not used to not seeing anybody. So um, I hope I don't look a bit rabbits in the headlights. I'm just looking at my presentation, which is is quite unusual. So anyway, I'm here to do this evening to talk to you about supporting potty training in early year settings. And what I just wanted to emphasise at the beginning is that I'm not actually a trainer, so I'm not training you. I'm giving you information which I hope you'll find useful. And um, yeah, any anything you'd like to say, pop it in the chat and hopefully I'll be able to pick up on that later. So um, next slide, please, Jenny. OK, so what we're going to cover in this session today is, um, as I said, we're going to explore the role that early years providers can play in empowering and supporting parents with the best advice so they can effectively potty train their children. Um, but before I started on that, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on Eric. So just an introduction to Eric and what we actually do. Um, and then really why we got involved in potty training in the first place. So really what's what's gone wrong with potty training and why this may have happened, how we can best make um, support available to people like yourselves and just start touching some of the resources we have and um, what's coming next to Eric in terms of potty training, training. And then hopefully we will have time for some questions and a bit of discussion um, if that all works for everybody. Next slide, Jenny, please. So I just wanted to start off with an introduction and I think Jen is going to make magic happen and show you a very short little video that's just a couple of minutes long. One in 12 children in the UK are affected by a bowel or bladder condition, including constipation and soiling, wetting accidents and bedwetting. The impact on children and their families' lives can be devastating. For more than 30 years, Eric, the Children's Bowel and Bladder Charity, has been dedicated to improving these children's lives and reducing stigma around these conditions. Our award-winning work is recognised in the UK and internationally. Our free helpline supports over 3,000 families each year with one-to-one -one advice and support. Our website is packed with clinically approved information and resources, including potty training, treating constipation, using the toilet at school, and supporting children with additional needs. We are the go-to training provider for the NHS on paediatric continents. The Eric Online Shop stocks bedwetting alarms, clothing, books, and bedding. As a charity, donations and profits we make are all invested back into our free services for families. So that's Eric. As you can tell, we are passionate about childhood continence. After all, we and poo is what we do. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, so back to the slides, hopefully. It always seems longer when you're sitting waiting, doesn't it? So next slide, please. Can we have the ne next slide, please? Tonight. Great. Um, Shown on my screen is the Our Vision slide. I don't know if our vision. Yeah. on mine yeah. as well, Jim. Right, OK, that's fine. So I can't see the previous one now, but um, before I could see back, the before and after, I could see both. It doesn't matter, but I could see both before. OK, 
we're, we're in the right place then yeah thank you thank you very much so our vision is that all children um, will live a he healthy and happy life regardless of any bladder or bowel issue um, that is going to change shortly because we've just had a strategic planning day about four weeks ago and we're looking at our vision and actually making it a little bit more visionary than that um, because actually we really want to get to the point where no child actually um, struggles with a bladder or bowel condition at all. Um, that's probably not going to happen in the next few years, but obviously a vision should be really far reaching. So, yes, yeah, so we're hoping to eradicate all bladder and bowel conditions if we really can. But in order to get there, there's a lot of work to go along the way. So can we have the next slide, please? So our mission really is, broadly speaking, to get everybody talking openly about good bladder and ha bowel health. And it is a taboo subject. We still find that many people don't like to talk about we and poo. Um, we've got a bit kind of blase about it in the organisation because we talk about it all of the time. And I forget myself sometimes you start talking about it, you know, with friends and family or out for a meal. And you can see, actually, I think I've gone too far. People just don't really like talking about it at all. So one of our kind of, well, our mission really is to empower children and carers with the support and information resources they need so that they understand their bladders and bowels and actually feel able to have discussions about it with their friends and family and most importantly with their GP, school nurse, health visitor and any healthcare professional or even their nurseries. Um, we contribute to research and policy development. It's never considered as one of the national priorities in England with NHS England. So we've always feel we're on the kind of on the climb, trying to get up and get our voices heard. We don't give up. Um, there's a lot of research going on and we are increasingly involved in policy developments. And we also strive to deliver the best education advice to all of those working with families. So we do um, train a huge number of the um, healthcare professionals in the in the UK. Um, and we do a lot of training now with parents and parent organisations. Next slide, please. And this is really important because there are so many people struggling in the UK with a bladder or bowel condition. So when we talk about bladder and bowel conditions, we're talking about anything from constipation um, and some of the things that go with constipation around stool withholding, um, leakage. Um, we talk about bedwetting. We talk about daytime wetting, which is different to um, potty training. It can be some bladder conditions. Children get UTIs. Um, we're talking about um, potty training and everything you can think of in relation to children's bladders and bowels, as well as children who've got additional needs and those with complex conditions too. The figure of 900,000 900, is very, very understated. It's an old figure. Um, we know the population in the UK has increased significantly since that um, figure came out. So we think we're looking at more closer to one and a half million children. We're also bearing in mind there that it's still, as I said, a taboo subject. So we know that it's underreported. So one and a half million is probably an underestimation, but that is the figure that we we estimate. Um, we haven't got the evidence for that figure in, in firm research papers. We can't change it, but we know that it's much more in excess of that. If we could sort out children's bladder and bowel conditions, it would reduce 80% of hospital admissions. So um, in terms of children attending an A&E with a condition that they don't need to go to hospital for, bowel conditions in particular, constipation is one of the largest, um, one of the largest number of conditions that children go to A&E for when they shouldn't need to get that far. One in three children are affected by constipation at any one time. It's particularly prevalent in children with learning disabilities and autism, often as many as one in two children um, with those kind of additional needs will struggle with constipation at some point. If it's not managed well, it can move on into adulthood. And I don't know if you're aware, but there have been a number of adults that have actually died as a consequence of const uh, complications with constipation. Um, and it's actually, um, about nine adults in the last year have died as a result of constipation. It doesn't get that bad in children, but it's really important with children with us, say with additional needs, that it's diagnosed and treated and managed effectively. Research has shown that about 40% of children with a bladder or bowel condition do get bullied at school. So if you can imagine a child that's sort of turning up in school after wetting the bed or has accidents in the classroom, they're likely to be very tired. They're not going to be on their game. They may be a bit smelly. Um, children are very good at picking up 
things when a child isn't quite the same as them. So it can have huge consequences on the ability to learn, um, absence rates, and as I said, bullying is often something that's tied in with all of that. And we know from the um, families that call our helpline that continence problems can put a strain on the whole family. Um, sticking with bed wetting again, you know, if you've got a child that's wet in the bed, um, changing sheets in the night, um, crying in the night, siblings being disturbed if one child gets up because they've wet the bed, um, alarms that they may be used to try and stop bed wetting that can wake up the whole family. It can be really, really difficult. And then also things like constipation and um, bladder conditions can impact on families going out, children going away to camps, on school trips. So it can be a really, really difficult time for families, particularly as a, pro as a topic they don't actually necessarily want to share with other people outside of their family. Um, next slide, please. So before we go any further, we're going to go into potty training now. I'm not going to talk anything more about Eric generally this evening, but I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. So um, what do you think is the average age of potty training today? Do you think it's A, under two years old, B, aged between two and two and a half years, or C, between three and three and a half years? Well, you obviously know this subject very well. Um, I think that's probably the oh, it's changing. I don't know if you can all see the poll on your screens, but we haven't got we've got at the moment we've got two percent under two years old, twenty four percent between two and two and a half, and seventy five percent between three and three and a half. So um, it's only 109 responses and it looks like we've got over 400 people on the on the screen. So if anybody hasn't had a guess yet, please do. 114. OK, what's oh, going up a bit more? It's probably long enough. Well, you won't be surprised to know, 74% of you won't be surprised to know that actually what you've said is, is correct. And um, to move on to the next question. How, is it okay to go on to question two, Jenny? Yeah. So in terms of how confident you feel about supporting potty training, so if you're working in a setting, how confident do you feel supporting potty training? Or if you're um, an inspector, how do you feel about talking to settings about supporting potty training? Low in confidence, going up to five, which is high confidence. Perhaps you could just click on which where you feel you are right now. We've done that dreaded thing. We've got a poll with five, five in, and I forgot we should have had four or six because we're all creatures of habit and we go to the middle. So it looks here that nearly half of the people here feel OK about supporting training, I'd say. We didn't give each of these categories, but it's kind of you feel OK about it. Or not sure either way. So I wonder if we took number three out. Um, actually, Jenny, can we do that one again? Can we do the run this poll again and ask, ask people not to go for number three? Is that possible? If it's not, don't worry. I don't think it's possible in the moment, I'm afraid. No, never mind. Not to worry. Not to worry. Um, OK, well, that's been really helpful. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next slide. Just realize I've still got my poll on my screen. OK, so um, you are quite right that the average age of potty training has increased to three and a half. The worrying thing about it being an average is that that means there are some children younger, but also there's quite a few children being trained older than three and a half um, and going into school age. So if we think back to sort of 60 years ago, um, the majority of parents were helping their children to use the potty as soon as they could sit up. And we know there's, there are reasons for that. 
many mums were at home with their children. They had plenty of time to spend um, sort of sitting with their children, playing with their children, supporting their child's development. Um, but I think also, well, I know, um, in addition to this, there was obviously the dreaded nappy, the washing the nappies, the smell of the nappies, the pails, the buckets, the pans on the stoves, all of that horrible, horrible um, rigmarole connected to nappies. And why wouldn't any parent want to get their children out of those nappies as quickly as possible? We didn't have disposables 60 years ago. Um, I'm not 60, I'm not far off, but I am in the generation when my mum was actually boiling the nappies on the stove. And so there were three of us. And when my brother was um, born, I was 18 months old. And my mum's very proud to say that I wasn't in nappies anymore. So I would imagine you wouldn't want to be doing very many nappies on the stove and having a newborn plus a toddler in nappies. So there was a really big incentive then for parents to get their children out of nappies. And so that trend continued really into the sort of the 70s and the 80s. Um, and then um, things changed a bit, you know, the, um, our social situation changed, more parents are going out to work. Um, there was the introduction of disposable nappies, which have become increasingly absorbent over the years. So whereas they started off, they weren't great. Um, they were better, I think, than Terry nappies, some parents thought. But more recently, they are so absorbent, children don't even realise they're wet. And parents don't even see the signs that there's a baggy nappy hanging down around the knees. They're so good. And because our social um, situations have changed, and I say there are more parents going to, to work, um, there are more children being brought up in single parent households and spending their time between two different parents in different households or being looked after by other members of the family, spending more time in childcare. It just means that the family setup that we used to know is very different now and very fragmented and it makes it much more difficult to get any kind of routine in place. So all of these um, things have actually resulted in the, the age of children being toilet trained increasing to close to three and a half. Um, and um, these recent surveys, um, even before COVID, were suggesting that more children were starting school still wearing nappies. And you'll be aware that since COVID, um, school readiness across the board has reduced and we have seen many reports that suggest there are even more children starting school in nappies and they're not ready to learn. So Jenny, next slide, please. Back in 2018, before COVID, obviously, we partnered with the National Day Nursery Association, which is an umbrella group for early years settings. Um, and we partnered with them and we did a survey which went out to all of their nurseries. Um, and the respondents there said that 68% or sorry, 68% of the respondents there said that they felt in the last five years, children were being trained later. And the reason they cited was busy parents postponing potty training. 92% of the people that responded believed that toilet training should be a shared responsibility between nursery and home. And 70% revealed that um, their staff don't receive any training on how to support potty training um, or training on healthy bladders or bowels. About 50% of the nurses had a potty training policy in place. Um, but within the policy, only a very, very low number actually identified um, anything around managing constipation in children. And again, a very small number talked about um, children's drinking during the day. Even less talked about the appropriate time of day that children should go to the toilet. And I mentioned all of those things because when you come to toilet training, those are some critical things to actually think about. So it's great to have a potty training policy in place, but it'd be interesting to know what are actually what information is actually contained in those policies and how they're actually taken forward. Next slide, please, Jenny. So delay in potty training is a problem. Um, and later potty training is actually so associated with a rise in bowel and bladder problems. Um, conditions such as constipation can go undetected. And if they are undetected, they, be they can become chronic, which means they're much more difficult to treat, much more difficult to manage. And um, it will take a long time for the 
bowel to be repaired in order for children to be able to go to the toilet properly and control what they're doing. Research has also shown that children who are toilet trained later are more likely to have bladder conditions um, in childhood going into adulthood. So there are good health reasons why it's important to potty train. Um, and it's a bit of a chicken and egg, really. Um, so at Eric, we became particularly interested in, in toilet training because we were concerned about um, the bladder and bowel conditions being spotted later and becoming more difficult to manage. The other side of the coin is if as a parent you want to toilet train your child and they have got a condition like constipation, it will become increasingly difficult to actually train them while they've got a condition like that. And the reason I say that is because the bladder and the bowel are very closely located. If you think particularly in a little child's body. So if you've got a bowel that's actually really impacted with poo, the bladder can't stretch. So you've got a squashed bladder. And ultimately, if you've got a squashed bladder, the bladder can't fill up with we. So the bladder is a muscle. And the idea is that you need to hold as much as the more we you hold in your bladder, the stronger the muscle will become. But if you've got a really big, um, say, engorged bowel, the bladder can't ever stretch. So it can't ever fill up with we, which means it can't hold we. So a, a constipated child, not only will they have problems passing a poo, they will also have a problem holding their we. So it's all really tied up together. So it's really important that the healthy bladders and bowels are part of the preparation for potty training. Um, the delayed po potty training is also a problem for schools. Um, again, this is something that happened. I was talking on the Victoria Derbyshire show again back in 2018, and there was a counsellor there from Walsall and they had actually employed someone to go into students in the schools and actually change nappies because so many of their pupils weren't toilet trained. It was taking um, resources away from the classroom by having the classroom assistants or the teachers trying to sort the children out. So, as I say, that was back in 2018. That's just one particular case we've heard of. And we know that it is a strain. And actually, teachers don't see it as part of their job. And there is a difference at school between children who are not able to go to the toilet independently because they have an additional need or because they've got a complex condition. That's quite different to a child that just hasn't been potty trained um, and how you might want to treat them. Later potty training also leads to extended nappy use. So this is not this is a bit sort of left field from our pure agenda, but we were all increasingly concerned about the environments. And later potty training does lead to an extended nappy use. Disposable nappies are the, one of the biggest contributors to plastic wa wa waste globally. And in the UK, they're actually the single biggest, sorry, they're the biggest single use item now that goes to landfill. So it really is a significant number of nappies going to landfill that wouldn't need to be going if children were potty trained earlier. Next slide, please, Jenny. So what we've done at Eric over the last few years, based on um, research and based on surveys that we've done and based on our experiences of talking to many, many parents on our helpline, we've developed the Let's Go Potty three step approach. Um, and there are many, many methods. I'm sure you've come across many of them. The, the, the three day model, the um, child led model, the parent led model. There are so many different ways of doing it. But we think that the three to five day model is brilliant if you've got a child that is absolutely ready, um, very receptive. You've got a very, very good routine and you don't you can get on with it with no interruptions. But that doesn't necessarily meet the needs of many families and many children. So what we say in our approach, and as I say, is evidenced, is that um, you need to take time preparing a child, preparing for potty training, taking their, um, in advance of actually taking the nappy away from them, helping them to move on to the next step. I'll talk a bit more about it when we go on to the other slides, but also practicing, teaching your child how to use the potty and feel comfortable around wee and poo, ready to introduce them onto the next stage. And you do all of this before you actually get to the point of stopping using nappies. So with all of that practice and preparation, the child has gained lots of new skills and confidence and they're ready to take the last step, which is to take the nappies off. 
And by doing it this way, it's it's much more effective in terms of making sure the bladder and the bowel are healthy, um, making sure you get over any of those problems there may be like constipation or um, troubles with your child drinking, get over all of those things first before actually getting to the point of trying to take the nappy away. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Jenny? So how can, how can early years provide or support children with the kind of the, the first milestones? So it's really important to have a potty training policy in place that everybody knows about. So we would suggest that when a, when a parent is deciding which nursery for their child to go to and there's a showing around and introduction session and the nursery talks about all of their procedures and what they want parents to do and the relationships and all of that, potty training is an integral part of that conversation. So when parents are deciding that the child's going to go to the nursery or the childminder, the parent knows what the stance of the, the provider is. And that's really important, I think, just in the way um, parents like to know what food is being served, um, what time nap times might be. This is something that should be integral to that. And there should be a potty training policy in place that the parents can see if they choose to. Now, at Eric, we did have a potty training, well, we have got a potty training policy, but we've just removed it from our website because it does need a lot of updating. So this was written in 2018 and we've looked at it's surprising how quickly language changes and thoughts change. So we've taken it down, but we do have a, a template that is um, available to nurseries to download and, and use as a, a template. Um, it's all about working in partnership with parents right from the get go. So being clear on expectations on both sides. Um, important to be able to spot the signs of constipation and flag to parents if you think it's an issue. And another big thing to think about is don't assume that a child with additional needs won't be able to, able to potty train. They will. In the majority of cases, they will. We encourage exactly the same steps. It just might take a little bit longer. But to delay toilet training with a child with additional needs is really not appropriate. What we don't want to happen is that children with um, a learning disability or autism are still in nappies by the age of eight or nine. It becomes increasingly difficult to train any child as they get older. And the worst case scenario is when you get a teenager who is heavier than their parents being changed when actually it's something that could have been done when they were little. Um, it becomes almost impossible as they get up to become an older child. Next slide, please, Jenny. So some of the things to do in the settings are making sure the toilets are well equipped, making sure that a child feels comfortable when they're going to the toilet. So they'll either go to the toilet on um, a potty or they may have um, you may use um, a toilet seat. If that's the case, a toilet seat on the main toilet. There needs to be some kind of step so that children can sit with their feet firmly on the on the floor with their knees above their hips. So they're in the perfect position to be able to go to the toilet. They may want to sit there for some time, um, particularly if they're in the early stages of familiarisation. So to have books and toys, things that they'll sit with and patiently and play with. Um, probably not appropriate in a nursery, maybe with a childminder. Things like bubbles are really good because blowing out through the bubbles, it relaxes a child. And if they're relaxed, they're more likely to open their, their bowel or their, their bladder and have a wee or a poo while they're sitting there. Making sure children have the opportunity and are encouraged to drink plenty throughout the day. So it's really important that children stay hydrated and that they take in enough fluid that they can actually stretch, stretch their bladder and learn to hold the wee. Toilet time, um, after meals and break times when children most likely to have a wee, need to have a wee or poo. So we know um, in schools, for example, it's very common that before lunch, the children might queue up and go to the toilet and wash their hands. Nothing wrong with doing that. And they may want a wee before their lunch, but actually they really do need to be going back to the toilet about 20 minutes after a meal, because that's when they're most likely to want to do a wee or a poo. Um, and obviously wash their hands again. Avoid using pull ups and putting children back into nappies to manage accidents. So again, we know um, that uh, in settings, we have we hear many times of situations where in the setting there's been a lot of hard work during the day um, with the child around potty training. And then a parent might come to pick them up and say, I've got a journey in the car. Can I just going to put a pull up back on them so they don't have an accident in the car? That's really not helpful. Um, 
if a child's, you know, out of nappies, to put them back into nappies just to avoid accidents, it's really giving quite mixed messages. Um, we know we've heard of stories where the children have been doing really well with their toilet training and they go on holiday for a week and they come back back in nappies. So really important, again, not to sort of really over over overkill, really, but not to overemphasize the fact that the relationship in, between home and the parents is so important. So training for the early years settings and helping the staff be more confident um, helps in those conversations with parents, because I'm sure um, you find it in many situations that the parents ultimately they're in charge it's their child so the more you can convince them and, and work with them to make help them understand the importance of consistency the better and we always say it's all important to recognize potty training as a development milestone and seek training to gain knowledge and confidence so there's about 40 different skills involved in actually a child getting to be independent using the toilet or the potty and they're not going to come overnight so it's recognizing the different milestones along the way to move forward with that Jenny, next one, please. So some practical tips, start early and help them to use the potty from sitting up if they can. So going back to that slide earlier when I said, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, children were encouraged to sit on the potty from the time they could sit up. And we would really encourage that now, even if they're sitting on the potty in their nappy, you know, we're not suggesting that children from six months can necessarily independently use the potty, but just introducing to the potty, having the potty around. If they do a poo in their nappy while they're sitting on the potty, then maybe um, flush the poo down the toilet and let them see the, the poo being flushed away. But all of those things, just keep it, putting them on the potty on a regular basis, getting that feeling of relaxation. So it's part of everyday life, really, from sitting up. And then keep the take it, stop and use a nappies, keep that to the very last stage of the journey. Don't be over ambitious because they happy to sit on the potty. Don't don't push it too fast. Let them go through the stages. Be playful and try to give the children consistent messages and expectations. And I've talked about the kind of consistency of messages and expectations between a setting and home. But actually, it's really important that the children themselves get consistent messages, um, you know, that the, the, we talk about we and poo a lot. It's part of everyday language, even before they can sit up when they're having their nappies changed. Um, talk about we and poo, what they've done, that is good, uh, or just making it part of everyday language, really. Don't leave anything to guesswork. And really, if you can, avoid using pull ups. Pull ups are not helpful. They're confusing for children. They feel like a nappy, but we pretend they're pants. And they're not pants, they are more a nappy. So it's a very confusing concept. So try not to use them if you can possibly help it. Uh, next one, please. So let's go potty is, as I say, what we what we call our three step approach at Eric. Let's go potty, let's go together. So we really do believe it is a partnership between everyone. Um, we think it's useful to reframe potty training as potty learning. So you're doing a little bit at a time and do it sooner. So as I said before, you know, when they can sit up, then put them on the potty to sit there and play. Um, when they can stand, start trying to change the nappy with the child standing rather than lying down. It just changes the emphasis a little bit and puts just it just changes things up a bit. They're not being baby, they're being encouraged to, to kind of be a bit more grown up. Um, good. There's good and clear evidence that if we delay potty training until a child is three or above, it's not good for their bladder or bowel health. So it's an extra incentive to get on with it. It's not. It's not just about the fact that it's it's good to do because they'll be able to be independent of nappies. It is actually recommended for their good bladder and bowel health. Waiting for readiness. We hear about waiting for readiness a lot. You could be waiting a very long time. So there will be some children that do show they're ready. They might be, there are signs like they might wriggle or they might be fidgety when they're having a wee. Um, I know my own son many years ago used to pick the front of his nappy. So we knew there was something going on down there. Um, but actually for many children, particularly um, as they get older and they're playing, they're not really taking a lot of notice um, whether they're having a wee. If they're in a nappy that is so absorbent, they don't actually feel wet, they don't feel uncomfortable, what what is the incentive for a child and they're not going to put their hand up one day and say mummy I think it's time to go to the toilet now I want you to take these nappies off it just doesn't work like that so 
it's up to us as the responsible adults to actually take the lead. It's not um, it's not a, 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 a development milestone that really should be child led because children children don't know what they're leading. They don't they don't know what they should be doing. So parents do need to take the lead and work with their child. Children are ready to learn from the day they're born. We all know that. You know, readiness isn't really a thing. They're ready for everything. They're ready the, the, ready the day they're born for anything and everything. So we need to do this in a way that motivates the child, makes it very normal and engages and fits with parents' busy lives. And although we say we want to accommodate children's needs, most potty training approaches have missed out on this and they don't really put the child at the centre of the experience. So it's really important that the child is part of it all the way through. Um, and also, as I've said before, it's much better for the environment and it saves money. It saves money for the family, you know, to get the children out of nappies. Disposable nappies are really expensive and I think people have just accepted it as a way of life. Um, but it's not, you know, and if people really thought about how much they're spending on nappies and how much they could save just by tra training their child one year earlier, um, how many nappy changes children have in a day? I should have had these figures written down, actually. But say six nappies a day, 365 days of the year. It's a lot of nappies. It's a lot of expense and a complete waste of time. So, Jenny, next slide, please. So um, I've done a whistle stop tour through this. Um, but what we are developing currently at ERIC, we are developing some potty training e-learning modules for early years practitioners. So um, we are working, we, we are, I should have said at the beginning, we're a UK based charity, but we're actually based, you might be able to tell from my accent, we're based in Bristol. So because Bristol City Council are on our doorstep um, and they approached us because they are really struggling with more children starting school in nappies and they wanted to do some work with their early year settings. So what we're actually doing with Bristol City Council, we're running a pilot um, and what we've We've talked to a lot of nurseries and it'd be interesting if you've got any views yourselves, but we used to run a half day workshop for practitioners about toilet training. And we cover quite a lot around healthy bladders and bowels in that. And everybody that came said it was an excellent webinar of, sort of half day webinar. But the challenge for us was getting people to come because half a day out of an early um, pra early as practitioners week day is a lot. Um, and I know that you're often very um, staffing as an issue. So to actually take somebody away from the setting for a half day is quite significant. So what we're doing instead, we're developing four 15 minute videos, which will have a Q&A at, at the end. The first one is focused on preparation um, and it'd be much more coherent in the way I've talked about it today. because I'm conscious I, I feel like I've jumped all over the place a bit. But the first one will be all about preparation. The second one about practice the third one all about stopping using nappies and then the fourth one will be about um, supporting potty training children with additional needs which as I've said is not different but it will pick up on other things like um, children who will only poo in a nappy or children who are toilet avoiders and things like that there are some you know conditions that children with addition over and above that we need to think about with the children with additional needs so that's the four pilots we're developing at the moment um, we're going to roll that pilot out in January in Bristol we're going to do some evaluation we're going to talk to the settings beforehand their staff are going to run do the do the videos and then we're going to get feedback from the sessions at, from the settings afterwards as well as from the individuals to see if that meets their needs. If it doesn't, we'll tweak it. And if it does, we're hoping to be rolling this out in the spring next year. Alongside that, we're also still gonna run our half day webinar, but we're gonna call it, it's a potty learning champion. And it's like a train the trainer set, um, session. So we think it will be useful for maybe when you've got um, a, uh, an early years provider that's got a number of settings. You might want one person to be the train the trainer that covers a number of sessions so they've got more in-depth knowledge so if there's a problem in a particular setting there's somebody that you can turn to who's got a bit more in-depth knowledge on it um, so it might be for some nurses you actually want to have one person in your setting that's the real expert and the others sort of know the day-to-day -day things but that's what we're looking at and then what we're hoping to do is add to those modules so looking at one that's all around choosing um, which nappies to use. So 
although you might not be able to tell um because i'm quite anti disposable nappy because i understand about the environmental impact of them um we don't we don't say you should work do one or the other i mean for different families and different circumstances it's not for anyone to preach as to what kind of nappies people should use but actually you don't necessarily need to choose one or the other you know you can use a combination of both so just some really useful information for nurses about nappy use um nappy disposals all of those kind of things um and then another one we're looking at introducing is um you may have heard of elimination communication which is a particular approach that is quite um there's kind of it's quite niche but it's about um children being trained from birth so they don't actually use nappies now i'm not sure how practical that is to um for an early years provider to actually be able to operate but for childminders if you've got only one or two children if that's something that you're interested in um you know, there will be particular parents who are very keen on that so we think we've got the four core ones and then what we'll do is we can add extra ones as the as the need arises for people to to use um and then um stage two as i said we'll be rolling this out in the spring stage three um is actually going to be developing resources for parents that support what the earlier settings are doing. So we have resources on our website, but what we were thinking is after we've done the pilot, we want to talk to the session, the, um, the, the settings that we run the pilot in and actually talk to them about. So based on what you've learned, what would be really helpful for you to be able to then share with parents? And it might be that it would be some similar kinds of um, videos like these, but tailored slightly differently towards parents. It might be a particular app that you might think would be useful if, if you use apps in your settings. So it's to find out what, what could we provide that would enhance the learning so that it makes it much easier for you to have the relationship with parents, if that makes sense. And then once we've piloted that, then we hope to be able to roll out everything properly in the summer 2024. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. And what I've done here, because I'm sure you'll be um, the, the the slides will be shared with you afterwards. I've just listed there some resources that you might find helpful that we've got on our website at the moment. There's all new stuff coming on all the time, but this, these are some things that you might find helpful. And I think that is probably my last slide. But Jenny, can you move on? Ah, so mm -hmm. the two final questions from me. Um, first of all, um, what we'd like to know is based on this, I feel like I've rambled on, I can't believe I've been talking for 45 minutes, um, but is there one takeaway from our discussion this evening that you would that you would say take into your setting? If you could just think of a word or a couple of words that you think have been really valuable from today. I hope there's some words. Oh my goodness, there's no words. Oh, I'm, it's because I think I've got to put a word in myself. Um, oh gosh. Great to see parents right at the heart of that. I'm guessing that it's about developing a relationship with parents earlier, right in the middle now. That's great. That's really good. Parents are back in the middle again. A bit more thinking going on. We've got 89 responses here. Well, I was going to say, let's see if we can get over 100. Last few before we close it. I think that's probably it's 125 i think that's pretty good don't you yeah oh, 140 it's very interesting because whilst some of those words are in quite small print there's not that many words so i think that makes it hopefully helpful for you to think about um you know when you've got like some of these word clouds you end up with about 45 different words on and it's quite hard then to pick out the kind of the key things you want to focus on 
Um, but when you've got a fewer number of words like this, it does make it easier to be focused. So that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Juliet. OK. There, there and is then another question. Yeah, oh, the final question is um, a repeat of the question I asked you at the beginning. But how confident you feel, it's a bit unfair actually, because I've not been training you in every, anything, but based on what you've heard today, um, how confident do you feel now about supporting potty training on a scale of one to five? Hope you don't feel worse. This is very encouraging because we've got more on four now than three. It's great. Let's try and get over a hundred before we stop. One more. Great. Right. So it's more than four percent. So that's really good. I'm very pleased to hear that. <laughs> That's that's really good. OK, thank you. Um, next slide, please. And I think that must be my last slide. Um, there's a, say, a QR code there if anybody wants to look at the ERIC website, but it's quite an easy um, website address to remember. Um, it is encouraging that more people had four than three. Um, and as I said, this was never intended to be a, a training session. And I know many of you will know about potty training. So if it just makes you feel a bit more confident about Maybe some of the things that your gut reaction anyway, that's good. Um, and I think, you know, some of the words that came out there about relationships with parents and getting started earlier, um, it's really encouraging to, to hear. So um, I don't know what you want to do now, Marie. Do you, is there anybody wanting to ask any questions? Yeah, I think or? there's a couple of things in the chat line. Okay. Uh, Julia, yeah. I'm not sure whether people have got access to the hand facility now. Jenny would be able to tell us. Here's Jackie will tell us what's in the chat line. Yep, there's a quite a few, Marie and uh, Julia. You've definitely sparked um, quite a lot of debate in the chat. And, and yeah. once we take your presentation down, you'll be able to see it. A um, couple of questions for you is how do services sign up and find out about the up and coming things that are happening with Eric so that they can keep their you know, the providers are kept up to date, they can take part in whatever it is you're developing or access the training that you're, you've are you spoke about. There's a lot of interest in your e-learning modules and your half-day yeah. sessions. OK, I think that I think the easiest way to know that you're going to find out about things is to sign up for our newsletter. Okay. So um, if you go to, um, can I share my screen with that? Can I do that from here? I don't yes. think so at the minute, Juliet. Right, okay. I don't know if you can cut and paste the chat to your website into the chat, put it in. Well, basically what it is, if you go to the Derek website and scroll right down to the bottom of the front page, um, at the bottom on the right hand side, there's a place to um, register for our newsletter. So you just put first name, last name and your email address and you'll automatically get our newsletter. So there will be news definitely in the newsletter about, about that. And obviously what I will do as well, I will let you know, um, yep. uh, Jackie, and Marie will let you know as soon as there's more information available so you can pass it on. But the best way to know about anything that we're doing is to sign up to the newsletter. Um, we do um, a whole range of other training um, and events for parents as well. So um, yeah. about I saw that in the newsletter this morning. There's a lot oh, of yeah, things sessions for yeah. parents. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. again, that would so, be something for providers to signpost to parents to or post it up or sh share as part of the newsletters yeah. for services yeah. even. Yeah. Um, and again, everybody's on the same page. And um, we've had some questions around standing up versus sitting down for wee boys. Oh, from potty sitting training. Down. Sitting, sitting down. Sitting down, definitely sitting down. And the main reason for that is you can only sort of, you can be more confident that the bladder has emptied properly if they're sat down. Mm -hmm. um, but also if they're sat down, there's more likely if they feel like doing a poo that they will do it rather than having, you know, because otherwise if you're just wee and standing up, you could quite easily, you know, even if you had a feeling about a poo, you might not want to be bothered and go off and play. So we'd always say sit down. Yeah, the other question. Yeah, sorry. 
So well, some of the other questions that are around, you mentioned using toys and distractions. So a therapy or approaches when you're potty training and taking toys and uh, books into the toilet. Um, from an IPC perspective, obviously, we've just been through quite a, a, a the pandemic and whatever. So there's a lot of anxiety around that. So we would not encourage keeping toys and books in toilets. But I'm assuming you're meaning taking the toys and the books in that are wipeable and clean and then once a child is you wipe them all down and then clean them yeah. appropriately is that what you mean yeah, Rather yeah. Than well, it's very it's very easy for me to, it's very easy for me to sit here and say you know toys and books and obviously if someone was at home they would probably have toys and books around but it's got to be appropriate to the the health and hygiene of the setting so yeah perfect yeah. and a lot there was a lot of questions in the chat around health visitors do you run sessions for health visitors because obviously they play a big role in sharing that message around potty learning potty training for yeah um, younger children so is it yeah. appropriate I, I mean you spoke about the responsible adult so I'm assuming that y y we're talking about even care staff and, and uh, practitioners within ELC settings you know supporting that approach yes is that we do, what you mean? We, yeah. we, we do training with um, healthcare professionals um, sorry health visitors yeah. um, a lot of our training um, a, lots and lots of train, um, health visitors come on to our healthy bladders and bowels training so because they're healthcare professionals they get a more in-depth healthy bladders and bowels and it will also touch on the potty training side yeah um, and we've been involved with nhs england so i can't obviously speak for what happens in scotland but we've we've been working on a pathway um in with nhs england which um, a lot of the pathways around conditions, say constipation, are aimed at primary care. But the new pathway we've got starts with healthy bladders and bowels from birth. So the kind of the naught to five or the naught to four bit is all really around the health visitors relationship with the family rather than the um, uh, the, the healthcare professionals working in primary care. So we're, we're really trying to get the health visitor, the public health role, um, much more engaged on potty training okay. and good bladder and bowel health. I think some um, some of the questions around about health visiting were were about maybe a lack of health visiting services, and I think that that would be true um, everywhere. Without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, yeah. the role, the health visiting role, has changed quite markedly. I know somebody mentioned about twenty years ago it was a different you know it was easier to get hold of a health visitor yeah. to do health promotion yeah. work with you and with the children that you you're uh, looking after um but the health visitors themselves have got different priorities and very often um their priorities sit with vulnerable children and vulnerable yeah. families yeah. and they don't have that same generic role that they've had in the past um like when i was a health visitor we had what's called a universal caseload so yes. every child was on you know under under five before they went to school and were handed over to the school health mm -hmm. services um but they, they they definitely don't have the same opportunities to meet with um families yeah. um and to offer um health promotion advice in the way that they used to mm -hmm. uh, but there, there will be pockets of um of that still available nationally but it's not universally available no. it's, a, it's the same in england you know there's some areas they seem to be very well resourced yeah um and i think a lot of that i mean i i'm sorry i'm speaking of england um but oh. um you know the it, it often it depends on the priorities in the in the kind of geographical area of the strategic yeah. leaders there and how important they see the public health role in some areas yeah. we're seeing there's more investment in the um public health role and in other places it's practically gone yeah. so it's really difficult isn't it um yeah. in terms of potty training what i would what i would say is the potty training itself you know it isn't rocket science is it um it's about routine and consistency and getting started if if as in an as an earlier provider you think a child is constipated um or has um you know there's there's something like they've got smelly wee or they've got very dark wee you know they may have a uti or if they're constipated i just recommend that you ask the parents to make an appointment to see their doctor their gp because they if they've got constipation they do need to be prescribed laxatives they can't buy laxatives for children over the counter and so they do need to be assessed. So 
if it's a you know if it seems like a blad or bowel condition rather than you are worrying too much about getting hung up on it if you think that is a problem then really encourage the parents to take the child to the GP and so you can also ask suggest parents look at our website because they'll find information and we always say to parents in the end you know you can try you can try the drinking um and all of that kind of thing but ultimately if your child's constipated you need to see the GP Juliet, there's tons of other questions in the chat. I Is mean, that... you've, you've certainly opened up. I, I mean, I don't know the best way of doing this. We can probably catch up about this after. I mean, we can collate some of the questions and then maybe, I don't know, have a wee FEQ again that we can maybe send out later or post yeah. following this event. Because again, you can you can actually feel the sort of angst um, from the practitioners on the call because they really want to do the best for, for, for the children that they care for, but they're... I think this is such a big topic um, um, and, and it'd be worthwhile maybe maybe having a chat with you, but maybe running another session in the new I'm year sure, yeah. if, if you're up for that. it. Even if it's just a QA, and a if you'd rather I came maybe and just did a Q&A or something oh, like that. that would be very fantastic. Happy to do that. Would everybody be happy with that if you sort of like just put in the chat a wee thumbs up or something like that? And finally, Julia, oh, yeah. is, is there any scope, sorry, Marie, for Scottish services to get involved in any of the, your development work? Would you be willing for to have some of our um, nurses, yes. daycare yes. children, to get involved? So again, if you're if you're looking for any uh, volunteers, if you if you just you know maybe come through ourselves and then we can try and recruit for you, and then you can take yes. it. Are we well, with them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So what we would we want to do the this particular pilot in Bristol because we just need to do it once. We're pretty sure that once we've done it once, there'll be things we need to tweak. But I think what'd be really helpful to us is to um to try the pilot maybe in a couple of settings in Scotland because obviously we do appreciate there are differences around, I think we've talked about it before, around language. Um, I know we obviously we all speak English, but we've all got we've got different terminology for things. But also in terms of your policy in Scotland, there are differences between the way things happen in England and the way things happen in Scotland. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're so I can see on the chat someone's asked about if the policy will be updated. Um, yes, we will be updating the potty training policy. It'd be great if people in Scotland looked at that to make sure that we're not something that's you know contrary to the way you operate in Scotland. So let's keep the conversation open, shall we? And perhaps Perfect. if we talk again in the new year, I'd be very happy to come along and and what I'm not going to do is deliver a training session. Um, no, nope. but um, but a Q and A would be great. Yeah, just to really that really conversation. Sorry, yeah. Marie, I know we're no. I was just thinking, thinking that would that would be really helpful. I think for people, um, if we did a Q and A, so yeah. that we but but we can always um, collect the questions and. Um, the ones that have been asked today yeah. and, and use them as well as the kind of basis of the conversation that we have. So, yeah. kind of, we we were, you know, we had far more people trying to get on uh, to listen to you, Juliet, than we had space for. Um, so we have had to turn people away that yeah. would have liked to have been able to to come along today. So we, we would definitely value the chance and opportunity to have you come along again and, and do something similar. Certainly will. Certainly Thank will. you very much. Just, just one last thing. I've just noticed somebody yeah. said any information withholding. Yeah, it's all of that information is on the ERIC website. Someone did have their hand raised and they've put it down. They probably will get fed up waiting on us getting to them. <laughs> so I'm sorry, whoever that was, that we didn't reach you. And I don't know who it was, unless you want to raise your hand again and try again. There it Miss is. Shaw. Miss Shaw. Miss Shaw. I think maybe on mute. Oh, no. How's that? Can we hear you? Jenny, can people that are here? We're talk having to... issues enabling the microphones. Right. I think it's just uh, due to the sheer volume of just people the on the size. call. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, look, let's um, we, we, we'll move on and talk to uh, Joanne and, and Candice, but we'll certainly have a think about how we might best answer your questions. Yeah. Um, we'll probably do that through some kind of okay. um, 
written in some kind of written format. But if if Juliet's up for it, we'll invite her back to come and talk to us again and maybe make it more of a, a chance to, to get all your questions answered because it's been really helpful, I think. Uh, there's I think everybody's got something out of that discussion for sure. Um, and it might Thanks. give you the confidence to change what you're doing or to to challenge what's happening in, in your particular setting. So that thank you again, mm -hmm. uh, Julie. It's been really, very welcome. really helpful. And, and thank you for inviting me, but thank you to everybody for kind of joining for in the polls. It's been really yeah. good. And I'm just I'm just reading down the um comments very quickly. Uh -huh. And I just say most of most of the questions here, people will get those answers by looking at our website. Right. So Great. um so that's helpful. I mean, obviously there's things like the sensible things about yes. taking toilets, taking toys into the toilets, so they need to be washable. Yep. We've got that on our website. Yep. But um a lot of the things around stool withholding, toilets in a nappy, nighttime yep. dryness, all of those things, um, they're all on our on website, website anyway. Right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thanks, Julia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Is that okay um, if I stay on and listen to your yeah, next Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, okay, thank yeah, you. That'd be great. We'd love to have okay. you. So I'm going to pass you on now to Joanne Duncan, Candy Seekin, who are uh, Safe Staffing Advisors um, for our uh, Safe Staffing Programme here at the Care Inspectorate. And they're going to talk to you a wee bit about a change in legislation that's going to happen in April 2024. Hello, Joanne. Candice, I'll hand over to you. And again, if people have got questions, just put them in the in the chat line and we'll try try to answer them at the very end of of, of this presentation. Thanks, Marie. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. And I just wanted to thank everyone again for joining the session this evening. Um, I found that really informative, Julie. So thanks very much for providing that overview of Eric and the specific data and details regarding potty learning. We are here now this evening to provide information about the enactment of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act 2019 and highlight the significance of this act to the information that we've just learned about potty training. Firstly, I'll just provide an overview of our team and the new legislation. Um, as Marie mentioned, my name is Joanne Duncan and I'm supporting the ELC sector alongside my colleague Candice Aitken, who's on the call with us this, ev this evening. Um, I joined the Safe Staffing Programme in the summer um, a month of comment from the inspection team. And this programme was commissioned by the Scottish Government to support care services to prepare for the introduction of this new legislation, the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act, which will be enacted in April 2024. This is the first legislation in the UK that sets out requirements for safe staffing for both health and care services. The Act aims to enable high quality care and improved outcomes for people using services by helping to ensure appropriate staffing. Now, the Act itself places duties on health boards, care service providers, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, the Care Inspectorate and Scottish Ministers, and it will affect legislation that guides the requirements of the services that you currently provide. There will be changes to current legislation used for regulatory purposes, those being the reduction of Regulation 15 from the Scottish Statutory Instruments, which are currently regulated against at the moment. And we'll review this with you briefly as part of this evening's presentation. We've all been working with best practice documents and guidance materials such as Realising Ambition, the Health and Social Care Standards and the Care Inspector Quality Framework in order to enable safe and high quality care experiences and outcomes for children. And this legislation isn't seeking to um, inform any new models or innovative forms of staffing. Its aim is to support decision making and flexibility. Its purpose is to promote transparency in staffing and support an open and honest culture where staff are engaged in processes that affect staffing levels and that they're kept informed about decisions to those levels and those needs. So we can just move on to the next slide, please, Jenny. As we are a commission programme from the Scottish Government, we have data to provide, which we're gathering from two polls this evening. We'd be really grateful if you could support this by answering the first poll um, that Jenny's just going to pop up on your screen just now before we start. It is an anonymous poll. Um, we'll ask this again at the end of today's presentation. And it's not about judgment. It's not about questioning your, your knowledge base at the moment. It's just for data gathering for the Scottish Government. So if that can be popped up, please, Jenny.
Can people see the poll coming up? I can't see that one appearing. Did that appear? Yes, it did appear. It's That's gone great. now. It didn't appear on my screen. That's unusual. Oh. Next slide then. Thanks very much for completing that, everybody. That's really useful. Next slide, please, Jenny. So for our session this evening, we'll provide an overview of the Act to support you to prepare for an enactment in April 2024. We'll look at the guiding principles of the Act and we'll go on to review the current legislation related to staffing, that of Regulation 15 from the Scottish Statutory Instruments, and discuss the similarities to this new Act. And finally, we hope to have some time at the end for any questions and evaluations. Next slide, please, Jenny. So there are four parts to the Act, which you can see on the screen. Part one affects all services registered with the Care Inspectorate. These are the guiding principles, which I'll cover this evening. Part two is only applicable to services in the NHS. Therefore, they don't apply to services that you provide or that we regulate. The third part is applicable to care services. And this is where we see the similarities with the current legislation of Regulation 15. And Candice will review that with you this evening. Chapter 3A only applies to services using a staffing method framework, which at the moment are care home services for adults. There is a caveat in the legislation that Scottish ministers may introduce this in other sectors in the future. However, this would need to go through consultation processes and this will not be in use in the ELC sector by April 2024. Part four is a short part of the Act and identifies the ancillary provision which provides for the commencement of the Act. So this part of the Act, it doesn't hold any expectations from services. If we can just show the next slide, please, Jenny. Thanks. So we can see here that although the legislation contains much more detail than the current legislation in relation to staffing, that of Regulation 15, there are only some parts of the Act applicable to the ELC sector. So we'll focus on part one, and the first section of part three. And the next one, please, Jenny. Thank you. So part one of the Act tells us about the guiding principles, and these apply to all social care services. The Act states that the main purposes of staffing for health and care services are to provide safe and high quality services and to ensure the best care outcomes for people who use services. The rest of the Act is about making these main purposes happen. Services should be able to discuss how they've considered the guiding principles and use them when making decisions about staffing and supported their staff to understand the main principles of the legislation that underpins their practice. So all services will need to be aware of what the new legislation entails and consider how they will meet the expectations of the Act. And the next slide, please, Jenny. Thanks. There are eight headings on this slide and they feature within part 1b of the Act. These are the main principles and must be considered when arranging staffing in any service type in order to achieve the two guiding principles that were set out in the last slide. Most of these headings are similar to the expectations set out in Regulation 15 just now, and I'm sure that you will be able to identify areas of good practice within your own services in these principles. With the introduction of the health and social care standards, we're already working in ELC towards the first principle of improving standards and outcomes for children. The second principle here of taking account of individual needs is something many services do very well with their personal planning. Our quality framework identifies the benefits to children's wellbeing from effective use of personal planning. And we've heard how children and families need to be central to the planning process for potty training to ensure effective information sharing, which is used by all staff to enable that consistency and that continuity of care. And we've also heard about the importance of giving children consistent messages. So practitioners need to ensure that they're working in partnership with families. There are further supports available on the ELC improvement page specifically relating to personal planning um, with the re release of guidance documents last year and there's some bite-sized videos to support the use of the document so please review this bite-sized video and um, they're a great resource in terms of personal planning as well here for the second principle. The third principle to respect the dignity and rights of children is fundamental when children are potty training. Children require access to clean appropriate areas with opportunities to participate in decisions made about them and of course their right to privacy. So services need to provide 
effective cleaning and inspection processes for all areas children access, particularly during transition times such as potty training. I mentioned about um, children and families being central to planning processes, and this includes receiving updates from families and providing information about progress during their time in the service that their children have had. And this would need to be considered under principle seven of allocating staff efficiently and effectively. There needs to be arrangements in place to share that information with colleagues internally about children's progress and there needs to be time allocated to allow for that communication with families and what can already be really busy times of day during drop off or collection times. So when thinking about allocation of staff, there needs to be consideration given to ensure that there are minimum disruptions to children's routines, particularly if there are staff absences, whether they be planned or unplanned. And this brings us back to considering internal communication and information sharing appropriate to meet children's individual needs. So we've heard of the support available from Children's Bill and Bladder Charity. So it's important to recognise when children may need additional support and reaching out to work collaboratively in a multidisciplinary way when it's appropriate, which is identified in Principle 8. All of these areas are so important to ensure children are given the best opportunities to succeed in their potty training. Next slide, please, Jenny. Thank you. One principle we did want to draw your attention to today is in addition to current legislation, that being the well-being of staff. And many services already have measures in place to consider staff well-being. And we just wanted to acknowledge that potty training can be a really challenging time for staff. Therefore, it's appropriate to have um, support needs to be in place to achieve and maintain the well-being of staff working in the services during this time as well. There are a number of factors that could affect the well-being of staff during this time, you know, such as the additional time to go at the child's pace during this practice stage that we've heard about and reminding them and encouraging them to use the potty. We need to consider the impact on the individual staff if staffing levels are affected with increased visits to use the potty. And we've heard how important it is for staff to provide that comfort, that security and time to contribute to children's success in this area. So staff need to be suitably supported as well, both during the planning and preparation process and consulting with families and then during the practice stage as well. Our national guidance document, Realising Ambition and National Frameworks, including the Blueprint 2020, which documented the Scottish Government's vision for the expansion of ELC, all recognise that high quality workforce is a key driver in providing high quality care. And there is a link between the safety of people who use services and the well-being of individuals delivering the service. And this legislation aims to promote increased well-being of staff working in the care sector with the expectation that supporting staff's well-being can reduce sickness absence, burnout and work-related stress, meaning that they're available to care for people using the services. So in order to provide safe and high quality services, appropriate measures and checks will need to be in place to achieve and maintain the well-being of individuals working in the service. What that will look like will differ between services and it's about finding processes and measures that meets the needs of the individual services and their staff. The focus is on staff well-being insofar as it affects the main purposes of the Act to provide safe and high quality services and to ensure the best care outcomes for children. The important thing that services should be aiming for is that it's safe for staff to raise issues without fear of retribution and that there's a culture of service improvement, of transparency and open communication. The importance of these during potty training has hopefully already been highlighted. So that was an overview of part one of the Act and I'm now going to pass over to Candice who's going to tell you a little bit about the statutory guidance that accompanies the Act before moving on to providing an overview of part three. Over to you Candice. Thank you Joanne. Next slide please Jenny. So there is statutory guidance that accompanies the Act which has been developed to support organisations in meeting the requirements placed on them by the Act providing practical information on what organisations need to do. The statutory guidance can be found online and there is a link in the document on our Safe Staffing Hub page. The document provides clarification on some terminology used in the Act 
and it also provides further descriptors of the principles and detailed information about research that has been undertaken showing the link between the safety of people experiencing care and the well-being of staff delivering the services. On this slide, we have included the definition of high quality from the guidance, as referred to throughout the Act, and we've added the meaning of staff and who it includes. It is also worth pointing out that the guidance advises that students should not be considered as staff. They should be treated as supernumerary when they are participating in a placement or undertaking a protected learning time as detailed within their relevant course outline or conditions of employment. This would normally be included as students undertaking the work placements as part of their college course and not apprentices. Now, this definition of staff does not change from current expectations under Regulation 15. To support the use of the guidance documents for the Act, we have linked sections from the statutory guidance to each of the eight main principles that you've just seen. This information can be found on the ELC section of the Safe Staff and Hub page. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now let's discuss part three in a bit more detail. Part three of the Act outlines the duty on care services to ensure appropriate staffing. Now you still need to fully consider how many staff you need to provide that high quality service. The new legislation does not impose specific staffing levels and the ratios you currently be inspected against will not change at this time. It is part three of the Act that you should be used to determine what constitutes appropriate staffing levels by considering the nature of the care service and the size of the service you provide. The size of the care services, the aims and objectives you're working towards, the number of children experiencing care and the needs of these children. Now, with regards to potty training, we have discussed the need of having effective policies and appropriate infection prevention and control measures to be in place. We've also highlighted what considerations you need to be given to how many staff are required to meet the needs of these individual children whilst potty training. We know, however, that these additional roles could, to be carried out, services need to fully consider how many staff are required and the deployment of their staff effectively and efficiently to ensure those best outcomes for the children while supporting the well-being of their staff. Next slide, please, Jenny. Thank you. So the current legislation that covers staffing is Regulation 15 from the Scottish Statutory Instruments. It is a small paragraph in the instruments which details how providers must have regards to the size and nature of the care service when arranging their staffing and ensuring that at all times suitably qualified persons are working in the service. Now the ask of the new reg regulations are still present in the new Act, they just go into a little bit more detail as there is a focus on the recognition that we all know and appreciate that high quality staff provide a high quality service. The current expectation is when the health and care staff in Scotland Act comes into place in April 2024, this piece of legislation will be revoked. Next slide please. Thank you. So this slide demonstrates the similarities between current Regulation 15 and the Health and Care Staff in Scotland Act 2019. The wording from Regulation 15 on the left-hand side of the table and the wording from the new Act on the right-hand side. The only addition can be seen at the bottom of the slide, which is the well-being of staff. Now, Joanne has already discussed the additional expectations on staff and when supporting children during potty training. In part three, the focus on staff well-being relates to how well it will affect those main purposes of providing that safe and high quality service and ensuring the best care outcomes for children. Services should consider how they support staff to feel confident in their roles they are carrying out. Are staff included in reviewing potty training policies, procedures and risk assessments, for example? There should be ways to consider and include staff's views about the number of staff they need to best support the children they are currently caring for in their area, as well as their ability to cope with the combination of children's individual needs, in this case, potty training. Managers need to take into account the staff's well-being insofar that it affects those main principles of the Act. Therefore, the focus on staffing around children's needs and not set ratios. It is also part four of the Act that details the training of staff and the responsibility on providers to ensure staff are appropriately trained to carry out their duties. To fulfil current legislation, we already asked providers during inspection about induction plans and scheduled supervisions or appraisal systems in order for providers to assess, 
monitor and plan the appropriate training needs for individual staff. This links to the new Act and is about staff receiving appropriate training for the work they are to perform and being assisted to ensure their professional learning is current. Next slide, please. Now, we wanted to introduce to you the Knowledge and Skills Framework, which has been developed by the Healthcare and Staffing Programme within Healthcare Improvement Scotland and NHS Education Scotland. The aim of this framework is to support all staff within health and care sector to provide a consistent and inclusive approach to learning and development, and to support individuals and organisations in their understanding of workload and workforce planning and the application of this legislation. The framework is broken into four domains or learning zones, and within each domain there are four skill levels. The module for the first two skill levels, informed and skilled, are currently available on tourist site. This is an NHS Education Scotland learning and development platform. Although predominantly an NHS resource, everyone within the social care sector can set up a free account. The enhanced and expert levels are still being developed. The team working on the framework within Healthcare Improvement Scotland will be holding workshops throughout November to invite feedback and help them to understand if this resource is useful for practice and inform future developments of the framework. Now I'd like to send out a strong request that this information is shared amongst your networks and if possible, participate in the consultation. The resource is aimed at both health and care sector staff. So we want to ensure the social care sector have a good representation in the workshops so we can influence the review and development of the framework and ensure it offers appropriate learning experiences for the social care sector. The workshop series starts on the 14th of November and they'll be about 45 minutes long. There is some introductory videos that you've been requested that should be viewed before and they're only a few minutes long. All the information about the webinars, the dates is available on our hub page. Next slide, please, Jenny. Thank you. Now, we wanted to briefly show you the image of the staffing method framework that has been developed in response to Chapter 3A of the Act. To confirm, this framework is only currently being used in care home services for adults and will be not it will not be used for the ELC sector at this time. Now, this legislation is applicable to all health and social care sectors, as we've said. However, there are separate requirements for each. We wanted to alleviate any anxieties for anyone that they may have heard about the development of a staffing method, staffing method framework. Scottish ministers have not asked Ken Spectre to develop a similar framework for the ELC at this time. We will keep the sector up to date if this does change at any point. Next slide, please. Now, before we conclude our presentation this evening, we'd be very grateful if you could complete the second poll. Jenny, would you pop that question up on the screen? Thank you. And I'll give you a moment to submit your response. Bear with me, it's just loading. The system is mm. running very slow again. No problem. I know a few people said in the chat um, for Joanne's one they couldn't um, see the poll. Uh, it's up now, I can see it. Hopefully a lot of people can see it. So we really appreciate the, the feedback. Thank you. We have developed a poster that can be seen on the screen. And that is, you can actually download that from our ELC Stave Staff and Hub page. Um, and you can also find links to principles, statutory guidance, and any other relevant information and guidance on the ELC Hub page. If you wanted to keep up to date with our program and what we're doing upcoming events, please join our mailing list. Again, that can be found on our Hub page as well. Thanks. Joanne, anything you want to add to that? I was just going to answer one of the questions that's okay. in the, the chat quickly about whether who this is, applies to. So this applies to all services listed under Section 47 of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act, which for our sector are daycare of children services, so ELC centres, after school services, and this applies to all childminders, not just, a, not just childminders with assistance, all childminders. There is a specific section on our hub for childminders, so please do view that, and we will be holding some national webinars, and those dates will be released least on our hub page as well. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Hi. Joanne Candice. Um, if there's other questions, you can always send them uh, to our address that was up on the screen for the Safe Staffing Programme. Program. Um, um, I, I'm 
getting a terrible echo on my line. I hope you're not all hearing that echo. So I had the no, same problem, you. Marie. <laughs> Did you? Thank you very, very much for attending this evening. We really appreciate it. It's been great that so many of you have um, shown an interest in, in, in the information that we're providing. And we'll certainly um, think about how to best um, get more information to you in relation to, to both topics. Uh, and certainly the websites for ourselves at, at uh, the Care Inspectorate Safe Staffing page and for um, Juliet's um, information in relation to Eric and Bowel and Bladder uh, Care, uh, their own website. Um, there's lots of information there. But on behalf of the, the whole team that have been here today um, presenting the information to you, thank you for attending and good night.